I'm Pete. I'm Stephanie, and this is The Cool Part Show, our show all about innovative 3D printed parts. We're coming to you today from the NASA Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama. This thrust chamber assembly is made from laser powder bed fusion down here, directed energy deposition up here. Two metal 3D printing processes in one spacecraft part on this episode of The Cool Part Show. This episode of The Cool Part Show is brought to you by Carpenter Additive. The company's Powder Life solution is a combination of hardware and software technologies designed to help AM users manage their metal powders. Stay tuned after the episode for more on how this system works. Welcome to The Cool Part Show. If you enjoy the show, make sure to subscribe to get notified about new episodes on YouTube. And as a reminder, you can also sign up for our all access newsletter to find out about new videos before they're shared anywhere else. Today on the show, we're gonna be talking about this thrust chamber assembly. The thrust chamber assembly, except in this form, it is much, much less of an assembly. Thanks to additive manufacturing, this structure was produced almost entirely in one single solid fused together intricate metal piece. Multiple metals actually, we'll get to that. Here's the combustion chamber. Here is the nozzle. When we talk about spacecraft, we are largely talking about systems like this because the propulsion systems make up something like 70% of the cost of a spacecraft. And conventionally, this is an assembly. There are many, many intricate components joined together in sophisticated processes. This is difficult to manufacture. That's right, and so NASA has now developed this methodology where they're now doing 3D printing in succession using two different processes on two different printers, at least three materials involved here, and we're gonna talk about all of that. So multiple materials, multiple metals are part of this. Multiple research teams involved in this work as well. So we are at NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center in Alabama. Other partner organizations in this work have included, for example, the Glenn Research Center, Ames Research Center, Langley Research Center. The acronym covering all of this work is RAMPT, Rapid Analysis for Manufacturing Propulsion Technology. NASA is very interested in bringing down the cost and bringing down the time to manufacture propulsion systems like this. Additive manufacturing figures into that significantly, and this successful 3D printing build illustrates the beginnings of what's going to be possible. That's right. The thrust chamber assembly that NASA ultimately wants to build this way is going to be 10 feet tall, 8 feet in diameter, rated for 500,000 pounds of thrust. The one that we have here with us today is for 40,000 pounds of thrust. Um, but even getting to this size component, it's involved a lot of development, a lot of work, and we want to introduce somebody who knows a lot about that. This is Paul Gradle, principal engineer here at NASA. At the heart of RAMPT, uh, we're looking at the thrust chamber assembly or the TCA. And from the outside, these may look very simple, an hourglass shape. Uh, on these, but they're very complex. They have a series of cooling channels uh, within the walls. Uh, and on one side within the combustion chamber, you have the combustion process, upwards of 6,000 degrees Fahrenheit or over 3,000 degrees Celsius gases, uh, hot gases that you're combusting. And then this combustion chamber is, is going to expand those gases through the nozzle, creating thrust for the engine. Uh, well, in order to maintain wall temperatures so the material doesn't melt, uh, we have to include the series of these integral channels. Um, and we run the propellants through these channels. And sometimes these wall thicknesses can be just a few sheets of paper uh, thick. Integral channels, so we can see where this is going. So a structure like this that has to operate at high temperature, the way that's achieved is with a sophisticated array of channels running through this solid form to carry cooling fluid through this structure. And the, the conventional way to manufacture that system is to build the inside first, build that array of channels, and then build the outer structure around it. A lot of assembly, a lot of components coming together, a lot of 
different stations where assembly work is done, many different operations, many different companies involved. So what all of that means is a lot of complexity to production, resulting in manufacturing being uh, difficult and expensive and time consuming. When you're looking at how thrust chambers are manufactured conventionally, uh, we would use brazing and plating operations. There's a lot of specialty skills uh, in some of these operations. You can have long lead times for forgings and castings. There's a lot of machining operations. So typically we'd start out with maybe a 500 or a thousand pound forging that we'd machine 90% of the copper material away. And then you have to slot all these channels in there. And then we use the braze and the plating to close out these channels. You can find high scrap rates uh, with, with some of these assembly operations. And again, there's only a handful of expertise companies that can take on some of these unique brazing and plating operations. So what is striking to me about that is the thousand pound forging, right? This thousand pound forging made of this special NASA engineered copper alloy. So you have that made and you have that shipped and you pay for all of that. And then you machine 90% of it away to get the form that you really want. And we know that's how it's done. That's how aircraft parts are made. That's how spacecraft parts are made. But still, it's crazy that that is necessary. Absolutely. And so now by using additive manufacturing, NASA is able to manufacture net shape or near net shape components, which really dramatically reduces the amount of machining that you have to do, the amount of scrap that comes out of this process. And then they're also getting all kinds of benefits from assembly consolidation too. Right, right. Because you machine away 90% of the mass and that's not even the challenging part. The challenging part is making all of these precise closures and connections through sophisticated brazing processes done by skilled technicians all to build this very accurate assembled structure. And all of these things that we're talking about, all of these factors add up to make producing a part like this uh, much easier, faster, less expensive, and less prone to failure. So additive manufacturing has a lot of advantages. Uh, in this. We can print these as a single piece or a few pieces, so we're consolidating the parts. I don't have the long lead time with the forging, the castings. I've minimized all the uh, machining operations on these. And of course, since additive, we can create complex features. We can build all of these coolant channels directly uh, in there for the uh, propellants uh, to flow through. So the complexity of additive, we find advantages there. The ability to make unique materials such as the GRCOP42 uh, material and some of the other uh, copper alloys. And of course, huge reduction in the cost and the schedule associated with uh, thrust chamber manufacturing. So NASA is realizing all kinds of benefits from assembly consolidation through additive manufacturing. And we've seen that in other parts on the show. But typically when we talk about assembly consolidation, we're talking about just one printer, probably just one material, and that's not the case here. So let's talk about all the different sections of this part and how they are made. Conventional manufacturing has limitations. NASA's getting beyond that. Additive manufacturing has limitations and NASA has to get beyond that too. And the way they've done that with this part is by employing multiple different approaches to metal 3D printing for different sections of this structure. So let's talk about workflow. So the first part of this structure produced is the combustion chamber. It's made out of that NASA copper alloy, GRCOP42. It is made through laser powder bed fusion on a machine from EOS. We find that we need to use different additive manufacturing processes uh, for different components. Of course, laser powder bed fusion is great for fine features and some of the unique alloys that we're trying to build for thrust chambers, uh, but we're limited in the overall volume that we can build. For a thrust chamber assembly, the core part uh, of this is your combustion chamber, where your combustion process is taking place, you have very hot gases in there. So again, we have to use GRCOP42, which is a copper chrome niobium material, copper-based. 
as the, the liner in here. So we print this with all of the channels, integral channels uh, in there. Um, and we're limited in the overall build volume of this. Powder bed fusion, we're typically in the 250 millimeter diameter uh, with most of the platforms. Several platforms are moving up to 600 millimeter and 800 millimeter uh, diameter, which again, allows us a lot of advantages to make these large combustion chambers with the fine features. After laser powder bed fusion, there's some post-processing hot isostatic pressing, some machining, then it's ready for the next step. So laser powder bed fusion is great for the fine features in that combustion chamber, but to build this larger structure, NASA then switches over to a different process, directed energy deposition or DED. So that allows for the larger part of the nozzle to be built and also for transitioning the material away from GRCOP42 to something else. So the, the next step in the process for ramp is after we have our combustion chamber completed and all the post-processing is we will clad on what we call manifold preparations is we'll use the laser powder directed energy deposition process to clad on either an Inconel 625 or the NASA HR1 uh, material. And some of these materials, such as the NASA HR1, not being compatible completely with the GRCOP, uh, material, we have to use an interface material such as a copper nickel uh, on this. We want to avoid any deleterious phases uh, in the material and thus, thus this interface uh, material. DED, directed energy deposition. So now metal 3D printing, not with a bed of powder, but with powder flowing through a nozzle and deposited that way. And one of the possibilities that this brings is altering the mixture of that metal as you go, introducing a transition from one material to another through a gradual gradient to allow for the most integration and interlocking of those two materials. And that's particularly important first for joining manifolds to the combustion chamber. Manifolds also made through laser powder bed fusion, but made through a different material, Inconel 625. DED is used for the transition between those two elements, but then it is done on a very large travel DED machine from RPM Innovations, and the large travel becomes important because the same process, the same machine, is also used to 3D print this large feature. So we partnered um, with RPM Innovations as part of our development under the RAMPT project to do the development. Uh, working with a lot of their different machines and processes. Um, in, in part of this is we were able to go very large scale in the machines and get the features that we were looking for. We were trying to obtain about a one millimeter or a 40 thou um, wall thickness uh, with a lot of these. And we did a lot of early development on that and we were able to really control the channel sizes and the wall thicknesses required for the thrust chamber design uh, using, using that process. So we're using the same machine for both the bimetallic cladding for the manifold preparations and some limited areas of the jacket on the combustion chamber, but we're also using the laser powder DED process for forming the nozzle. There's a lot of development in characterizing uh, both the material, the geometry that we're getting out of the material from the DED process, uh, mechanical properties of the material and eventually we're able to move on to develop and, and deposit the nozzle directly onto the combustion chamber. And so if we think back to the conventional way that one of these thrust chamber assemblies would be put together, this is really exciting. Now instead of having all of those different little pieces, all of those tubes that need to be braised together, things that need to be bonded and lined up just right, now NASA is able to begin to build some of these features, like those integrated channels with laser powder bed fusion, and then continue them on through the rest of the part with DED. So there's a lot less assembly that's happening, there's fewer moving pieces, there's a less that can go wrong. We tend to think of additive manufacturing and all the advantages that it provides for the parts that we're building. But I think one thing that's very unique about additive is we are able to advance other manufacturing technologies because of additive. So in this case of the ramp project, 
we saw an opportunity that instead of doing a fully cladded structural jacket, we could use a composite overwrap, which is about a 35 to 40% weight reduction over a metallic jacket. And additive manufacturing enabled this, uh, the ability to build the combustion chamber and the nozzle as a single piece with all the channels integrated. Uh, we have a very fine closeout of those channels on the backside, and then we can use the composite overwrap filament winding to provide the structural jacket to react all the loads, the thrust loads, the pressure loads within the thrust chamber assembly. This eliminates distortions. So we typically see higher distortions on the order of three to 10% uh, when we're cladding, which means that my combustion chamber is going to shrink uh, both on the radius and the overall length of that. And the composite overwrap eliminates the distortions uh, from the cladding in addition to providing the significant weight uh, advantage for us. So even though we're dealing with multiple types of 3D printers, multiple materials here, multiple processes, this is still a more efficient way to go about building a thrust chamber assembly than it would be done conventionally. So just fewer parts to deal with, fewer processes, fewer suppliers involved, and less manual labor overall. And all those benefits, as great as they are, they're not enough. Ultimately, this 3D printed thrust chamber assembly has to prove that it can perform as effectively, as reliably, as the assembly that it replaces. And with thrust chamber development, uh, both the manufacturing development, uh, material development, uh, you're going to find a lot more going through the hot fire testing. We, we build parts, we test them, and if something's going to go wrong, it can go wrong in milliseconds. So we believe that it's very important to uh, design, develop, manufacture these parts, but put them through the paces of hot fire testing. Um, prior to hot fire testing, we do proof testing and we validate all the material properties. We do uh, inspections on these, but hot fire testing is going to combine all of the loads. Uh, we're going from cryogenic temperatures all the way up to elevated temperatures. In a matter of a few seconds, you're seeing these extreme thermal gradients that materials are incredibly challenged by. You see very high strains during those testing. Of course, the hot gases in there, the high pressures, and we can't simulate that with individual tests. We have to have that combined uh, loading. So being able to take the ramp technology and, and these thrust chambers through that full what we call design fail fix cycle and iterate on it is incredibly important. So we're not just building shapes anymore, we're building parts with pedigree. So as we've said, this is a smaller version of the thrust chamber assembly that NASA ultimately wants to build, but this design has been successfully hot fire tested and now NASA is using the lessons learned to scale up. So developing a full-scale thrust chamber using the ramp technology, uh, first time through, you know, took us years because we had to develop all of the materials. We had to develop the processes. Uh, we had to characterize these processes, the microstructure and the mechanical properties. But now that we've learned all those lessons and we understand each of the steps involved, uh, we can develop a full-scale thrust chamber in months. Uh, it's not years uh, like it would be traditionally. Um, the chambers uh, itself, the powder bed fusion process, we can build these in a matter of days or weeks. Uh, we're in process of building a full-scale RS-25 uh, demonstrator nozzle for our space launch system that is eight feet in diameter and 10 feet tall. So all of the ramped hardware in the thrust chambers um, have either been sized you know, to address um, industry interest uh, on this and industry alignment, or we're building parts uh, from the ramp technology you know, that have been scaled up to the, the needs of industry. All right, I think we got this. Take it away. Thrust chamber assembly uh, designed and engineered by NASA has to operate at very high temperature, and that is accomplished by flowing cooling fluid 
all the way through this system and structure. Combustion chamber, nozzle. Traditionally, this has been made through an intricate and sophisticated assembly process. Manufacturing has been difficult. So the method for manufacturing these thrust chamber assemblies that NASA is now proving out involves a combination of different metal 3D printing technologies and different materials, including laser powder bed fusion for the main body of the combustion chamber, transitioning into DED for the larger features. The result is a thrust chamber assembly that is much less of an assembly. For even more of what we found at Marshall Space Flight Center here in Huntsville, our All Access subscribers saw Paul describe the use of precision DED to make propellant tanks for use in space. Check it out. All Access, it's free to join. Thecoolpartsshow.com slash All Access. And if you have a cool part that you'd like to share with us, regardless of whether or not it's going to space, we'd love to hear about it. Email us, coolparts at additivemanufacturing.media. Thanks for watching. Thanks again to our sponsor, Carpenter Additive. In addition to supplying metal powders, the company also offers services, software, and hardware to help AM users manage their powder. One example is the Powder Life System, a combination of cloud-based tracking software with hardware designed to make powder handling easier. Two key components are the Powder Life Hopper and the automated docking station. Luke Boyer, manager of Powder Life Applications, and Andrew Holliday, applications engineer, explained how the system works. So today, when a user of, of additive manufacturing is receiving powder, they oftentimes receive it in either 5, 10, uh, 15, maybe a 20 kilo uh, bottle. Um, but they're receiving pallets of them, and you're receiving 10, 20, 50, hundreds of, of these bottles. The user you know, has to look and, and, and segregate and store them uh, appropriately so the bottles don't get mixed up. And it requires a lot of lifting and, and moving and labor. The components of Powder Life are all based around making the powder management systems on the added manufacturing shop floor easier to use for the operator, cleaner, as well as more traceable. Three of those basic parts of Powder Life are our Powder Life hoppers, or our storage containers for powder. The second would be automated uh, docking systems that allow material to be pushed in and out of machines with uh, no human contact. And the third would be our Powder Life online software system that allows you to trace this powder as it goes through your shop floor. The hardware, the software together just helps really streamline that and, uh, and, and improve the final user's experience uh, and let them concentrate on going from design to the part itself. It takes the headache of powder management out of the equation for them.